All right, time uh, we have is a couple minutes past. So we'll go ahead and get started. Call to order. Roll call, please, Mr. Wilson. Jason Knight. Here. Scott May. Here. Michael O'Brien. Here. Hallie Dunn. Here. We do have a quorum. Uh, before we start, Mr. Dunn, um, there will be three affirmative votes needed to pass, pass any motion. Very well. Okay, uh, for the public hearings, um, for tonight, the hearings will include staff presentations followed by any questions or clarifications from the board. Then the public hearings will be opened. At that time, anybody wishing to speak may do so once called upon by the chair. All public speakers must state their name and address for the record. After everyone wishing to speak have done so, the public hearing will be closed and discussion amongst the board members will start. The first hearing tonight will be WJPA 22 TAC 0021, 1485 John Tyler Highway. Mr. Long, please. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Trevor Long, James City County Watershed Planner here to present WJPA-22-0021. Ms. Carla Havens, Mid-Atlantic Resource Consulting, has applied for a wetlands permit on behalf of Mr. Larry Evans uh, for the installation of two breakwaters with beach nourishment and sprigging on property located at 1485 John Tyler Highway. Um, this property is within the Gordon Creek watershed. You can see the property as a whole outlined here in blue on the vicinity map and the uh, watershed boundary here in purple. An aerial photograph of this parcel, this uh, proposed project um, is in the middle of a series of properties that are along the Chickahominy River that have all received approvals to install um, breakwaters and shoreline management. Um, you, the neighboring properties and adjacent properties have um, also been heard by this board for very similar projects, but above you will see an aerial of this particular site and as a whole outlined here in blue. The topography, um, you will notice that along the edge and the bank of this river, is a fairly steep bluff. This bluff is experiencing fairly severe erosion at about six feet in height. Um, so it is for that reason that this property and the neighboring properties are um, proposing and installing uh, shoreline uh, management structures here. Uh, the applicant here is proposing to install a 15 foot by 70 foot breakwater and a 15 foot by 80 foot breakwater out in the middle of this river to mitigate some of this erosion that I was describing earlier. The uh, slide above shows the resource protection area here and the floodplain as it affects this property. property. On the site plan above, you will see in red uh, the mean high water mark for this property and the mean low water mark. Uh, this is the 15 by 70 foot breakwater, and on the right side, excuse me, you'll see the 15 by 80 foot breakwater. Also associated with this proposal is beach nourishment. Beach nourishment is outlined here in yellow, and also bank grading here in green. Uh, the bank grading is proposed at a six to one slope, pulling it back to match the adjacent properties. Um, projects as well. There are two cypress trees uh, that I will point out as points of reference in the following site photographs. Um, the bank grading uh, does equate to approximately 6,000 square feet of grading um, within the RPA, which I will touch on later in this presentation. Above is a cross section um, of this uh, breakwater system and some site photographs. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, a fairly um, extensive bluff here, um, sitting at about six feet. In the back of this photo, you can see uh, the bank grading and the, the stabilization that has occurred on the adjacent property. On the um, previously mentioned 
Um, site plan, the two cypress trees. So the beach nourishment is uh, proposed in approximately this location and the breakwater is on either side of these, um, these trees. You can see PVC pipes out here in the water. So this would be the 15 by 80 foot breakwater. More PVC pipes. Um, one of the neighboring properties, breakwaters. Uh, it's, it's difficult to see, however, there are pink flags along this row of um, bundled grasses. This is uh, the area that the bank will be pulled back to on that six to one slope. And looking out towards the breakwater system in the river. Um, a, a, a shot that captures uh, the shoreline and also the breakwater system as a whole. This shot that this photo is taken at low tide, um, so you can certainly see the need for um, grading here or some kind of shoreline uh, erosion project. In order for the proposed project to be authorized to impact wetlands and compensate for the wetland loss, uh, the following three criteria must be met. All reasonable mitigative efforts, including alternative siting, which would eliminate or minimize wetland loss or disturbance, must be incorporated in this proposal. The proposal must clearly be water dependent in nature, and the proposal must demonstrate clearly its need to be in the wetlands and its overwhelming public and private benefits. Um, if the proposed project cannot meet one or more of the above criteria, the project must be denied or occur in areas outside of the wetlands. Should it satisfy all three criteria, however, compensation for the wetland loss is required in one of the following um, options, off-site, on-site, um, or a mitigation bank in the same watershed or a payment in lieu of fee. Uh, staff has reviewed this application and finds that the project meets the three criteria outlined above. While there are no vegetated wetland impacts associated with this project, the applicant is proposing to agree approximately 6,000 square feet within the resource protection area. Therefore, staff will require this area to be replanted on four foot centers and for the proposed beach nourishment to be planted on one and a half foot centers. Staff has reviewed the above application and recommends approval of the application as presented. Should the board wish to approve the application, staff suggests the following conditions be incorporated into the approval. The applicant must obtain all other necessary federal, state, and local permits as required for this project. All development activities located in the specified flood hazard area shall comply with Article 6, Division 3 floodplain area regulations of the James City County Zoning Ordinance and receive all required approvals and permits prior to commencement of such activities. That a surety of $2,000 must be submitted in a form acceptable to the James City County Attorney's Office prior uh, to guarantee the mitigation plantings prior to the commencement of this project. That the wetlands permit for this project shall expire on November 9th, 2025 if construction has not already begun and if an extension uh, of the permit is needed, a written request must be submitted to the Stormwater and Resource Protection Division no later than September 28th, 2025, which is six weeks prior to the expiration date. Thank you, I'd be happy to answer any questions the board may have. Just uh, two breakwaters are um, in the water. So at, at mean high water, there's still exposure? Yes. Just uh, the, the normal amount, like a, a foot or two? Okay. Yep, and I can, I'll allow um, the applicant to speak more to the actual construction of that. Any other questions for Mr. Long? All right, thank you. Thank you. We will now open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak on this matter, please come forward. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. I'm Carla Havens with Mid-Atlantic Resource Consulting, 1095 Cherry Row Lane, Shackelfords, Virginia, 23156. Trevor, thank you for a thorough presentation. Um, regarding the staff recommendation and the conditions, the 2000 shared surety is not a problem. Uh, the expiration date's not a problem. You previously, if you, 
probably recall this, we've had a lot of, there's seven lots down there, five yeah. of them are doing something. Um, this is the sixth lot. And so there's Blindenbach on the upstream side and Van de Sand on the downstream side. And we're basically connecting the bank grading, we're connecting the offshore structures and just everything is just lining up with Danny Winnell's design on the one side and my design on the other side. Um, I forget what your question was. Um, and, and, um, I was asking about the sill, uh, how much exposure was there during that? Oh, the, the propo um, on the cross section it shows, I believe it's a foot over, it's gonna be a foot higher than mean high water. Yeah, 3.5 and mean high water out there is 2.5 to 2.6. So about a foot higher than mean high water, which just <clears throat> ties in with everything that's out there. All the other breakwaters yeah. are going in, yeah. yeah. And those other ones uh, nearby are uh, working effectively? Uh, Blindenbach, I don't know, because Danny just put those in like a month ago, but Van de Sand's working, um, Van de Sand is, is looking really good. He's got some root exposure that we're working on, but um, yeah, that, that whole stretch downstream is looking really good. And these are all located over by the bridge, right? Um, They're downstream of the bridge, yeah. There's seven lots over there that were subdivided from a larger parcel and... Um, right across from Chickahominy uh, Riverfront Park. Any other questions? I think the uh, existing breakwaters out there are probably of similar dimension to the ones proposed. I'm not sure if that's information that you would know or not, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I <laughs> yeah, I don't recall my design for the other structures, but mm -hmm. I presume it's all, yeah, it's, it, I mean, because that was like a year or two ago. Okay. Um, yeah, I, th I think what's proposed tonight is adequately going to take place, very good, is going to address the erosion problems, especially the bank grading in, in particular, yeah. All right, thank you very much. Would anyone else like to come forward and speak? If not, we'll go ahead and I'll close the public hearing and open it up for board discussion. This is, you know, for some of the newer members, we've seen these products over the last year or so, um, trying to stabilize that bank. Uh, I think this is, I, you know, I concur with the, with Seems the like staff a, to go forward on this. Seems like just another piece in sort of overall sort of master planning, so. Yeah. Yeah. There's no other points of discussion. Anyone like to make a motion? I'll make a motion to adopt the resolution to grant the permit request for wetlands board case number WJPA 22-0021, 1485 John Tyler Highway. So we have a motion to adopt. Mr. Knight? Yes. Mr. May? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Motion passes 4-0. Okay, the second hearing for tonight, WJPA TAC 22 TAC 0023 Uncle's Neck. Mrs. Benedict. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Robin Benedict, Watershed Planner, presenting WJPA 22-0023. Mr. Daniel Winnall of Water's Edge Construction has applied for a wetlands permit on behalf of Mr. Mark Gillespie, <coughs> for the installation of two riprap revetments on property located at 7624 Uncle's Neck within the Yarmouth Creek watershed. Above, you can see the vicinity map uh, with the parcel outlined in blue. And aerial photography um, showing the project area. Again, there are two riprap revetments um, on either side of an existing sill um, and area of beach nourishment. Here's the topography at the site. The resource protection area is shown in orange. 
and then the floodplain shown in this grayish blue color. Um, existing conditions of the property include two rock sills, one on either side of an area of beach nourishment. On May 9th of 2018, an application appeared before the Wetlands Board for the construction of these sills and the beach nourishment to mitigate for shoreline erosion. Uh, the rock sills were approved and construct constructed, but areas on either side of the sills are beginning to deteriorate due to unforeseen circumstances. Um, so here you can see mean low and mean high water by the blue dashed lines. Um, the proposed upriver revetment in yellow and the propo proposed downriver revetment as well as the existing sills and existing areas of beach nourishment. The applicant is proposing a 50 foot by 12 foot revetment on the downriver side um, and a 25 foot by 13 foot revetment on the upriver side of the existing sill. Here are cross sections of um, both revetments. For the um, downriver revetment, the crest will sit at elevation five and have a two to one slope, and the upriver revetment will sit on elevation 6.5 and also follow a two to one slope. This project is proposed between mean low water and mean high water, therefore this project must be heard by the wetlands board. Here's some site photography standing on the existing pier of the property looking towards the existing sills and area of beach nourishment. Zooming in just a little bit on the upriver side of the uh, proposed revetments and then looking downriver at the other revetment. This is just another close up of the downriver side and standing at a different angle, again, looking at the downriver revetment. In order for a proposed project to be authorized to impact wetlands and compensate for the wetland loss in some prescribed manner, the following three criteria must be met. All reasonable mitigative efforts, including alternative siting, which would eliminate or minimize wetland loss or disturbance, must be incorporated into the proposal. The proposal must clearly be depend water dependent in nature and the proposal must demonstrate clearly its need to be in the wetlands and its overwhelming public and private benefits. If the proposed project cannot meet one or more of the above criteria, the project must be denied or must occur in area, areas outside of wetlands. Should it satisfy all three criteria, however, compensation for the wetland loss is required either through on-site, off-site within the same watershed, um, mitigation banks in the same watershed or a payment of an in-lieu fee. Staff has reviewed this application and finds that the project meets the criteria outlined above. There are no vegetative impacts for this uh, proposal and no bank grading. Therefore, no mitigation is proposed as a condition of this permit. Staff has reviewed the above application and recommends approval of the application as presented. Should the board wish to approve the application, staff suggests the following conditions be incorporated into the approval. The applicant must obtain all of the necessary federal, state, and local permits as required for the project. All development activities located in the specified flood hazard area shall comply with Article 6, Division 3, floodplain area regulations of the James City County Zoning Ordinances and receive all required approval and permits prior to commencement of such activities. The wetlands permit for this project shall expire on November 9th, 2025, if construction has not already begun, with extensions of the permit um, submitted as a written request to the Stormwater and Resource Protection Division no later than September 28th, 2025, which are, is six weeks prior to the expiration date. Thank you. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them at this time. I have a couple questions real, real quick. So you said unforeseen circumstances. What what was what were those unforeseen circumstances? Just that there was that their erosion would start on the other side of the of the rocks or what was it? Do you know? Uh yes, the um erosion on the other sides of the sills was unexpected. Um I will allow the contractor to elaborate more on that. Okay. And then um the cypress trees could you go back to the picture of the down I think it was the downstream yeah right there yeah there with the that's where the um, 
they're gonna put the re revetment in. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, right there, please. So you have this cypress knees. Is it? I guess is it all gonna go behind? Yes. The, um, the contractor has said there should be um, no impact to the existing cypress knees. Thank you. Other questions for staff? All right. Thank you, Ms. Benedict. Thank you. We can now open the public hearing. Anybody wishing to speak, please come forward. Please uh, state your name and address for the record, sir. Good evening. I'm Danny Winall with Waters Edge Construction, PO Box 352, Toana. I'm the agent and the contractor on this project. Obviously, if we had known we had erosion like this, we would have included a revetment on either side of these living shorelines when we did the original proposal in 2018. But I'm, I'm surprised as anybody that it eroded like this, especially the 50-foot sill on the downriver side. You've got those cypress knees out there. Um, sometimes we have erosion that we just don't figure on. So, uh, But it uh, it's it's accelerated a lot in the last year or so. I mean, we went out there, I think we went out there once and then we went back out there and it 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 it, 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 it eroded about another two or three feet. So it's obviously needs to be fixed. When we did do it originally, we laid that slope back on like a three to one to mitigate any erosion that we thought would occur there. But obviously that didn't work. It needed to be hardened. So, and on up Riverside the same way. I mean, we're just gonna tie the revetments on either end just right into the sills and extend them extend this one over to the existing tree and then extend the other one over to the where there's a couple pine trees and cypress trees, but we won't impact any of these. Okay. So, on those deals. Yeah, um, I'm real familiar with this property because it's just about three or four houses down from me. Yeah, well, a little more than that, but it's, well, it's, yeah. it's, it's right down the street. Just down the street. Similar, but, similar, similar living shoreline situation. Yeah, so I've seen it erode over time, but, uh, just a, a, a question for you is, um, understand putting the revetment in there uh, where this place is eroded uh, is the right way to harden the, the situation, but was there any consideration given to putting a breakwater instead? Uh, no. I mean, you could put a breakwater out there, but then you would, I mean, you've got a one living shoreline system out there already, so. It's working the breakwater would have to be offshore. Then you'd have to do beach nourishment. And economically, for the, for the I mean, the property owner done what, didn't want, you know, they're kind of upset this happened to begin with, so they don't want to spend any more money than they have to. Okay. So it, it would be um, a little bit more expensive to put a It would be quite a bit more expensive. Because of the uh, the beach nourishment or just because well, of Well, the, the breakwater would have to be offshore of the knees, and you'd have to put beach nourishment behind it. So, yeah, it would be quite more, substantially more expensive, probably four times as much. Other questions? Thank you, sir. Anybody else like to come forward to speak on this matter? Okay, so we'll close the public <coughs> hearing and open it for discussion amongst the board members. And this seems like a reasonable and uh, necessary approach to uh, correct the uh, the issue familiar with the property yeah I mean I concur it it, it, it wasn't expected when I, I I remember when it was put in and it looked like a pretty good job but things happen right so now it's uh, got some corrective action that seems to be appropriate is there any specific or special causes you've seen to what seems to be an increase to the rate of erosion out there any particular storm events or is it just kind of a gradual overtime thing the past couple of years Be a, could be a variety of things. I, I don't remember the the direction, but I mean, a good nor'easter yeah. can take out, you know, a fair chunk of uh, soil pretty quick. You know, uh, I don't know what the fetch is right there, but you know, there's just a variety of factors. But yeah, I think this uh, is something that looks like it needs to be done. So. Anyone like to make a motion? 
I would, uh, Mr. Chair, I would make a motion to approve uh, WJPA 22 0023. So we have a motion to approve. Mr. Knight? Yes. Mr. May? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Motion passes 4 0. Okay. So the next hearing will be WJPA TAC 22 TAC 0024 at 1244 Mile Tree. Mr. Long, please. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Trevor Long, James City County Watershed Planner, here to present WJPA 22 0024 at 124 Four Mile Tree. Mr. Mo Bloxham of Southern Landscaping and Construction, Inc. has applied for a wetlands permit on behalf of Ms. Colleen McMurdo for the installation of a revetment on property located at 124 Four Mile Tree within the Skimino Creek watershed. This property can be seen in the above vicinity map uh, located here in blue um, and within the Skimino uh, Creek watershed outlined here in purple. This property is, however, located on the York River, uh, which you can see just adjacent to the outlined property here in blue. Um, the aerial photography of this above, again, shows the property here in blue and, um, and, and the project area located within this, this region here. Existing conditions of the property include an approximately two to three foot uh, sloughing bluff along the shoreline. Adjacent to either side of this bluff are two wetland marshes surrounding a small beach area where the majority, majority of the sloughing is occurring. Um, approximately um, the aforementioned uh, beach area is where this arrow is pointing and the marsh is in the two regions um, just north and south of this arrow. Uh, the topography of this site, as you can see, it kind of gradually slopes from the front of the property back towards um, the shoreline and um, has a couple of marsh draws uh, up in this region. The resource protection areas that affects this property and the floodplain as it affects this property. Uh, the applicant is proposing to install approximately 200 linear feet of riprap revetment over top of approximately 1,200 square feet of non -veg, uh, of 1,200 square feet of sand adjacent to uh, non-vegetated wetlands. Um, on the site plan above, you can see the revetment here in yellow and mean low water here in blue. Uh, later on in this presentation, you will see site photographs, which will include a uh, which will include staking. These are outlined here on this particular site plan in red, and the vegetated wetlands that are on either side of this proposed revetment are outlined here in green. A cross section of the proposed uh, revetment, as you can see, mean high water comes up approximately to the edge of the revetment, and mean low water um, is approximately 100, 100 feet channel word, according to this cross section. Uh, this particular particular cross section is the northern um, most revetment, and this cross section is on the southern side of the the revetment. The proposed revetment, excuse me, back up just a little bit as well. The proposed revetment also wraps around an existing tree in order to attempt to save the integrity of this tree. This tree is circled here, um, and the revetment is proposed to go around it. Some site photographs, uh, again, the existing vegetation uh, can be seen clearly here uh, with the staking occurring in this region. Um, looking back from the, uh, the, the stakes that I was just showing, you can see the pine tree 
And the stakes, again, here is following this, this general um, area of vegetated. There's a stake here um, in this tree. Staff does feel um, that the site plan shows the riprap revetment wrapping around this tree. Um, the stakes could indicate that uh, it goes through. Therefore, uh, staff would make a permit of this condition, uh, excuse me, a condition of this permit um, that uh, a meeting occur on site to ensure that what is shown on the site plan matches the stakes in the field prior to the commencement of this um, project. This is looking back towards the scarped beach area um, that is in between the two vegetated marshes. Um, it generally just follows the shoreline here um, or the toe of the slope. Looking back towards the pine tree again, this is the tree in question that they are trying to wrap around and save and then continuing on the revetment on the other side. And the northernmost um, area of uh, marsh area that the revetment is kind of tying into or halting at. Uh, in order for a proposed project to be authorized to impact wetlands and compensate for the wetland loss in some prescribed manner, the following three criteria must be met. All reasonable mitigative efforts, including alternative siting, which would eliminate or minimize wetland loss or disturbance, must be incorporated in the proposal. The proposal must be clearly water dependent in nature. The proposal must demonstrate clearly its need to be in the wetlands and its overwhelming public and private benefits. If the proposed project cannot meet one or more of the above criteria, the project must be denied or must occur in areas outside of the wetlands. Um, should it satisfy all three of these criteria, however, uh, compensation for the wetland loss is required in, this, in the, um, the sequence of acceptable mitigation options should be as follows. On site, off site within the same watershed, mitigation bank in the same watershed, or a payment in in lieu fee. Staff has reviewed this application and finds that this project meets the three criteria outlined above. There are no proposed vegetative wetland impacts associated with this project. Therefore, no mitigation is required as a result of this wetlands permit. Staff has reviewed the above application and recommends approval of the application as presented. Should the board wish to approve the application, staff suggests the following conditions be incorporated into the approval. The applicant must obtain all other necessary local, state, and federal permits as required. That all development activities located in the special flood hazard area shall comply with Article 6, Division 3 floodplain area regulations of the James City County Zoning Ordinance and receive all required approval and permits prior to the commencement of such activities. That a meeting shall take place prior to start a project to ensure the location of stakes matches what is provided in the site plan. That the project shall not cross property lines without approval from the adjacent property owners. That wetlands permit for this project shall expire on November 9th, 2025 if construction has not begun. Um, and that if an extension of the permit is needed, a written request must be submitted to the Stormwater and Resource Protection Division no later than September 28th, 2025, just six weeks prior to the expiration date. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, just a, a um, question for you, Trevor, is when, when these, this permit um, application comes to you, is it come to you pretty detailed before you get involved, or do you actually get kind of a concept and provide some input? It certainly depends on the, uh, the permit. Um, you know, for this one in particular? This one, uh, some, some further um, details were uh, requested um, as part of the drawings. Um, I think there was two to three rounds of um, revisions or questions that were asked and then clarified further. Yeah, the, the, the reason I ask is that um, just from my limited view of the uh, site conditions, um, it appears that a water sill would be um, a natural fit for this application. And that way you don't have to sit there and, and you don't need to put a revetment as a barrier, you know, for the ecological flow of f between land and, and water. So it, it's more suitable ecologically to put a water sill in there 
unless there's some other reason why a hardened revetment uh, would would be the the solution. Um, that is certainly true. I will let the uh, the contractor uh, speak to that. Okay. Okay. If there's no questions for staff, thank you, Mr. Long. Thank you. Go ahead and open up the public hearing. Would anyone like to come forward and speak on this matter? Please state your name and address for the record, sir. Uh, Mo Bloxham, Southern Landscaping and Construction Incorporated, P.O. Box 275, Shackelfords, Virginia. All right. Good evening, uh, Mr. Bloxham. The, the first question was, I think, why not have a sill? Uh, this damage occurred in one storm. This was not a cumulative. People bought the property and they had one storm and all of this damage happened at one time. And uh, I just happened to live right across the river, on the York River, right across from them. And uh, the wave action is excessive on the York River. And I've seen movement in my own uh, shoreline, two or three feet. And I'm not talking about a hurricane. I'm talking about just a normal storm. Uh, it's really going to be somewhat of a Marcel Toe when they go up the flanks. That's not going to be uh, on the grass. It's all going to be channelward of all of that. So it is a combination, really. The revetment's in that really scarped out area that's up against where the tree is. And then the rock will be somewhat of a sill trying to stop any more erosion from wrapping around and getting back into that area. But this was not a, a, a long-range erosion. This was a one-storm event, according to uh, Ms. McBurdo. And that's the reason for wanting to put riprap up against the, the shoreline. No, I, it, it, clearly the rip riprap is going to harden that shoreline and, and uh, prevent the erosion. And it, but, but it's a pretty convoluted path that it's taken. Uh, it just... Um, you know, we, over the last couple of years, there's been a, a movement towards uh, more of a living shoreline approach, which would be putting that revetment out in the water, uh, breaking, the, breaking the water coming in, putting some beast nourishment in, and allowing some submerged aquatic vegetation as well as some other vegetation to grow in the backfill area. So it's, it's ideally a, a better solution um, from the standpoint of, uh, of ecology. But... Um, so I'm just wondering, did, was that even considered? Or? Yes, sir. I wrote a, a statement to that effect uh, that, from my experience living there, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't take – you'd be back in there. It's a hard access area. Uh, the um, neighbors granted permission to get over on their property to get down in there, and they would like to fix it one time and not have an ongoing project to stabilize their shoreline. That's a pine tree you're going around, not a cypress tree? Pine tree. Yeah. Yes, sir. Any other questions for Mr. Bloxham? No? All right, thank you, sir. I actually have a question for staff. So do I close the public hearing or what's the process okay I'll keep it open hey, so uh, BMRC right they, they, they have a, um, a website where you go in and you enter all your information that tells you if you're suitable for um, for a living shoreline or not Do, in, uh, and I'm going off a couple of years ago when they first came out with this what uh, and there was like a, you basically got a, you got feedback that said, hey, this is a good, this is good for a living shoreline or it's not. Do you know if that was done? Do you, did you see the, um, or was there any con consultation with? Uh, there VMRC was consultation with VMRC. I'm not aware if that particular um, uh, program was used in this case. Um, but I do know that there was a little bit of consultation between the county, VMRC, and the applicants um, associated with it. Did the VMRC provide any? I didn't see it in the package. Did, did they provide something? 
that said that this wasn't a good spot for a living shoreline? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, uh, VMRC is here if they choose to um, weigh in on that matter. But I mean, I'd like either from the applicant or the, the, the contractor or VMRC, I'd like to hear just a little bit of the rationale behind why the living shoreline would not work in this case. Either open the public hearing. Yeah. Public, yeah, the public hearing still open. So, sir, if you'd like to speak, and then we would like to hear from the VRMRC as well. So. Living Shoreline would not stand the wave action. This isn't like up in a creek or in a, a, a protected area. This is wide open. And when the waves break up in there, it's like in my house. A four, five, six foot. Uh -huh. This is not like a calm body of water that just has a tide movement, you know, up and down. And uh, this is like uh, big waves. I mean, this is serious stuff. And, uh, you know, the access to the uh, area and uh, the fact that the intensity of waves on a regular basis, and I'm not talking about hurricanes, I'm talking about just any storm. Okay, um, so it would be uh, short-lived to live in shoreline, but it wouldn't last through a couple of these activities. Like I said, the, um, the damage occurred in one storm. This was not 10 years of gradual erosion. People were amazed. They bought the property, had a storm, went down there, and all this damage was done in that one particular area, and they, you know, want to just stop it where it is, and it's all scarped. Uh, I mean, probably four or five foot up in root masses and all, so, you know, um, it needs to be fixed, you know, and stop the erosion uh, where it's at. And uh, so, I mean, plus they want to put a pier in there later on, and so they just, you know, want to get it fixed and permanent fix you know, would be to rip rap against the shoreline sure. and up around the tree. D did you have any conversations with the MRC about this particular piece of property? Um, or, or have you just only, uh, re regarding a living shoreline with this property? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I mean, I've studied them and uh, I've discussed with them. And uh, certain areas, you know, we, we use them uh -huh. wherever there's uh, a calmer body of water. Uh, and, uh, you know, the York River has places in it that are as rough as the Chesapeake Bay when the wind gets up and whatever. And uh, by no means is this a calm body of water. It, it, it just is, I said, I've been living there 30 years, and I've dealt with it and whatever. And it doesn't have to be a hurricane. It can be just a thunderstorm or something, the wind gets the right way, and uh, the waves can get four or five feet. All right. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, anyone else have questions for Mr. Bloxham? Okay. Thanks, sir. <laughs> You're good. Um, I'm Lauren Schreitzer. I'm with VMRC. So there was a law change in 2020 that requires living shorelines to be permitted unless the best available science proves that a living shoreline wouldn't work at that property. Um, VIMS is the arbiter of that science, so it's not VMRC. Okay. The tool you're talking about is a VIMS tool as well um, in, in um, cooperation with William & Mary. So if the board is concerned about the applicability of a living shoreline here, you can always uh, delay it, have VIMS weigh in on the, the project. They did not weigh in on this project. Um, I can't give you VMRC's opinion because I can't change the board's decision. But if you would like to wait and have VIMS weigh in, that is always an option. Okay. okay thank you. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? I guess my last statement is that I accept uh, Trevor's recommendations, the staff's recommendations, 
they'll be followed uh, exactly as they've outlined it and uh, the on-site meeting to make sure that our project is within the guidelines we've requested through a site meeting is, is definitely accepted by me. Okay, thanks, sir. All right, if no one else is going, would like to speak on this matter, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing and open it up to the board. Um, this, the, my sensing of the board is kind of that we'd like to, I, you know, I would like to hear uh, BIMS kind of weigh in and see what they, see if the living shoreline is, is proper for this. Uh, for this property yeah I'm of the same ilk that that there ought to be some uh, determination about whether it's suitable or not for that um, I, I respect the the uh, applicants or the contractors opinion about the suitability but uh, certainly getting another op opinion on that because to me um, you know this this is the kind of situation where the living shoreline in my mind, would be suitable, and I'd like to hear why. If if it's not, you know, some specific reasons for it. Now, here's the thing: is even if you get um, an assessment that a living shoreline could work here, but you'd rather go with a more hardened revetment solution, maybe there's some other circumstances like, oh, I need to put in a pier, and and this is going to be make make it more suitable for a pier, or or the the expense of the living shoreline is is uh, is too much, you know. It, you know, some reason why um, you wouldn't uh, do it, even though it might be suitable. That would be, in my mind, something I'd like to hear as well. I think there was a comment earlier about uh, um, referring this to, to get that opinion. Is that how? Is that uh, Mr. That, Ms. Yeah. Mr. Chairman and the board, just a reminder to the board about uh, protocol. Um, the board cannot request a deferral for the applicant. The applicant has to request a deferral. If the applicant does not request a deferral, the board is here to give an up or down vote on the project um, as uh, applied. So we cannot ask for a deferral. So that's on the applicant. I mean, you can see you can see in the picture the, the fetch a nor'easter across there is going to is I trust his professional judgment. I mean, looking at that, but also I'd like to hear from like to hear from Vim's. So unless it's uh, deferred, we'd you know I'd have to as is we'd have to reject it, or I I would reject it. Other discussions from the board? Sir, uh, um, I'm going to go ahead and re I'm going to reopen the public hearing, sir. Very sorry. Just so, just please uh, state your name and address again, real quick, for the for the record. Okay, uh, Mo Blocks from Southern Landscaping and Construction Incorporated, uh, PO Box two seven five, Shackleford's, Virginia. Um, you know, I can ask for a deferral if that's what y'all are talking about. Uh, at this time, until the next meeting. Is that So he's asked for deferral. Do, do we make a motion to defer? Um, Mr. Bloxham. Yes. We don't um, have enough time to take this to the next meeting in December. Um, so I, I would request uh, the January meeting, please, sir, uh, to give Vims some time to weigh in on the matter. That's what it is. That's what it is. <laughs> okay. I just want to be. I, I want to make sure you understand. Uh, we don't. We will not have enough time 
uh, for the December meeting. That's fine. I've been here before. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, so we'll need a motion to defer and then a vote on that motion. Right. So I close the public uh, hearing. Yeah, we closed it. Yep. Let's cool. I'll make a motion to defer. Uh, please, please keep the motion, uh, the uh, public hearing open so we do not have to re-advertise. Okay. Uh, reopen the public hearing. Would anyone like to come forward and speak on this matter? No? Okay. Um, can I have a motion for deferral? Yeah, I'll make a motion to defer uh, the um, case number WJPA 22-024 at 124 Four Mile Tree. So we have a motion to defer. Mr. Knight? Yes. Mr. May? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Motion is, or, uh, yes, the motion is approved 4-0. That concludes our hearings for this evening. Um, board considerations, the 2023 calendar. Um, have a 2023 calendar or? Oh, we just approve this? Okay. Everyone's had an opportunity to look at their 2023 calendar. Yeah, the, uh, the calendar is for the second Wednesday of, of every month for 2023 starting at five o'clock. No change. No changes. Voice of approval. Just a motion to approve and a voice vote, please. Okay, I make a motion to approve. Uh, voice vote. All in, all in favor say aye. 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 The voice vote passes. Thank you. Um, and we do request, staff does request deferral of the election of officers until the December meeting. Yeah, Mr. Rowley would be nominated for everything if he's watching right now. So. <laughs> Did I need a vote on that? Or? That's fine. Okay. All right. So the election of officers will be deferred. Very well. So that concludes our board considerations. There's no matters of special privileges. I make a motion to adjourn. Yes. All right. Meeting adjourned. All right. Call to order the James City County Chesapeake Bay Board. The responsibility of this board is to carry out locally the Commonwealth policy to protect against and minimize pollution and deposition of sediments in wetlands, streams, and lakes in James City County, which are tributaries to Chesapeake Bay. Uh, roll call, please, sir. Jason Knight. Here. Scott May. Here. Michael O'Brien. Here. Hallie Dunn. Here. Okay, the outline for tonight's public hearings will be a staff presentation followed by any questions or clarifications from the board, then the public hearing will be opened. At that time, anybody wishing to speak may do so once called upon by the chair. All public speakers must state their name and address for the record. After everyone wishing to speak have done so, the public hearing will be closed and discussion amongst the board members will start. The first hearing tonight, CBPA Tech 22 Tech 0132 103 Cove Road, construction of a sunroom and deck. Um, Ms. Benedict, please. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Robin Benedict, watershed planner, presenting CBPA 22 0132. Mr. Timothy Jones of Two Rivers Built has applied for a Chesapeake Bay exception on behalf of Mr. Christopher Ch Tucker for encroachments into the RPA buffer for the construction of a sunroom and deck on property located at 103 Cove Road within the Kings Point subdivision and the College Creek watershed. You can see the parcel located here um, outlined in blue. Again, Kings Point subdivision um, and the purple line is the College Creek watershed. This parcel was platted in 1967 prior to the adoption of the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Ordinance in 1990. Here's aerial photography of the project location. You can see the existing home. Topography at the site, uh, behind the house there is a fairly steep slope leading down to um, the ravine. The resource protection area in green, which encompasses the backside of the existing home. 
The total lot size of this property is 0 0.75 acres, of which 65% is located within the RPA. Existing conditions of this project include a failing sunroom, upper and lower deck. Uh, you can see the sunroom here um, attached to the, the house with the upper deck next to it and the lower deck in front of both of those structures. It's for this reason that the applicant is proposing to construct a new sunroom and deck as well as extending that deck um, to replace these failing structures. That can be seen here in the site plan uh, with the 100 foot and 50 foot resource protection area. The yellow is the proposed deck extension. Um, with this deck extension, it will equate to 313 square feet of uh, impacts in the landward 50 foot RPA. And then the existing impervious cover, which is not included um, in those calculations because there's already existing footprint there. Required mitigation for this amount of impervious impacts equals one canopy tree, two understory trees, and three shrubs. <coughs> Here is site photography showing the existing sunroom, upper and lower deck on the property. Um, a better photo of the existing deck connection. And from the side of the house, um, you can see at the edge of the home and then wrapping around the other side um, is where the deck will be extended out to. Staff has evaluated the application and exception request for the construction of a sunroom and deck. This application meets the ordinance conditions in sections 23-11 and 23-14 and should be heard by the board because the construction of a sunroom and deck is considered accessory in nature. The board may grant exceptions to section 23-7 if the application meets the following five conditions. The exception request is the minimum necessary to afford relief. Granting the exception will not confer upon the applicant any special privileges denied to other property owners in the vicinity. The exception request will be in harmony with the purpose and intent of Chapter 23 and is not of substantial detriment to water quality. The exception request is not based on conditions or circumstances that are self-created or self-imposed and reasonable conditions are imposed which will prevent the exception request from causing a degradation of water quality. Staff has reviewed the application and exception request and has determined the impacts associated with the proposal to be moderate for the proposed development. Staff recommends approval for this exception request and if the board wishes to approve the request, staff recommends the following conditions be incorporated into the approval. The applicant must obtain all of the necessary local, state, and federal permits as required for the project. The applicant must submit a mitigation plan equating to one canopy tree, two understory trees, and three shrubs to the Stormwater and Resource Protection Division prior to project start. A surety of $500 must be submitted in a form acceptable to the James City County Attorney's Office to guarantee, guarantee these mitigation plantings. The applicant must place three inches of gravel over filter fabric underneath the footprint of the deck. This exception request approval shall become null and void if construction has not begun by November 9th, 2023, with written request for an extension to the exception submitted to the Stormwater and Resource Protection Division no later than September 28th, 2023, which is six weeks prior to the expiration date. Thank you. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them at this time. Mr. Chair, I have a question. Um, is, I didn't physically see this site. Is the, it's a pretty steep slope in the backyard there that goes down to the ravine. Is that a pretty stable topography wise? Is that pretty stable at this point? Yes, at this point it's fairly stable. Based on the uh, proposed site depiction, it didn't really look like there was much of a need to impact more of the steeper slopes. It kind of looked like things would sort of be tying out around that 50 foot contour and things are going to be getting steep just beyond that. So in your estimation, probably no really critical steep slope impacts with, associated with this, probably not? No, not with this project. Um, immediately surrounding the house, it's still fairly flat. Okay. Um, so I'd say maybe 10 to 15 feet off of the back of the house is when the slope starts to um, decline. Okay, thank you. No other questions for Ms. Benedict? No, thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak on this matter? 
please come forward and state your name and address. No? Okay. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? All right. We'll close the public hearing. Uh, board discussions? It's, it's uh, pretty straightforward. Minimal impact. It's pretty straightforward. Okay. Would anyone like to make a motion? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to adopt the resolution to the grant to grant the exception request for Chesapeake Bay Board case number CBPA 22-0132-103 Cove Road. Do we have a motion to approve? Mr. Knight? Yes. Mr. May? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Motion passes 4-0. All right, the next hearing will be CBPA TAC 22 TAC 0141 821 Arlington Island Road. Case presentation by Mr. Long. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Trevor Long, watershed planner, here to present CBPA 22 0141. Mr. Michael Hipple has applied for a Chesapeake Bay exception. Uh, for encroachments into the RPA buffer for the construction of a detached accessory structure located at 821 Arlington Island Road within the Diaskin Creek watershed. This property is shown above here in blue, and the watershed boundary, as discussed earlier, is here in purple. A, um, an aerial photo of the portion of this project, or property of which the project is proposed to occur, is here. Uh, the total lot size of this property is 12.7 acres, of which 64% is located within the RPA. Contours and the topography is shown above. Um, it is a fairly flat lot, um, but does slope uh, towards either side. It's really kind of a peninsula with water on either side of this portion of the property. Um, topography slopes down towards the water on either of those two sides. Um, the resource protection area as it affects this portion of the property, as you can see, the majority of this section of the property and uh, the area where the existing house and driveway are, are encompassed by RPA. The floodplain as it affects this area. And the site plan that has been submitted. Total lot, uh, like I said, the total lot size of the property is 12.7 acres. 64% um, of it is located within the RPA. The applicant is proposing to construct a 60 foot by 30 foot detached accessory structure, which is outlined here in yellow. Um, again, the, the purple line here is the RPA, as I was talking about earlier. Um, this proposed ex accessory structure would equate to 1,800 square feet of impacts to the landward 50 foot RPA. Uh, two alternative locations have been considered um, and locations have been provided by the applicant. Um, for the purpose of this conversation, I'll call this uh, alternative location A is proposed here in yellow. Uh, both of these two areas do occur outside of the RPA and this is the furthest one is considered alternative location B. Um, while both alternatives are outside of the RPA, uh, the first alternative is proposed 390 linear feet away from the house, and the second alternative is proposed approximately 730 linear feet away from the house. It is for this reason that the applicant has expressed uh, the need to put this detached accessory structure um, in the resource protection area and the location of which has been provided. Um, Require mitigation for this amount of impervious impacts equals four canopy trees, eight understory trees, and 20 shrubs. This would be approximately four and a half planting units. Uh, staff has evaluated the application and exception requests for the construction of a detached accessory structure. This application meets the ordinance conditions in section 23-11 and 23-14 and should be heard by the board because the construction of a detached garage or accessory structure is considered accessory in nature. Some site photographs. Uh, this is kind of standing on the existing driveway looking towards the, uh, the entrance. Um, 
of the detached accessory structure. There are pink flags um, in the woods and you will be able to see them better. Here is some ribbing um, that indicates one of the sides of the, uh, the structure. Standing on existing impervious area, um, this orange flag here indicates the one of the sides. And uh, orange flagging here, this is the 30 foot section of this um, of this detached accessory structure. Looking back uh, towards the driveway, the board may grant exceptions to section 23-7 if the application meets the following five conditions. The exception request is the minimum necessary to afford relief. <clears throat> Granting the exception will not confer upon the applicant any special privileges denied by chapter 23 to other property owners. The application request will be in harmony with the purpose and intent of chapter 23 and is not of substantial detriment to water quality. The exception request is not based on conditions or circumstances that are self-created or self-imposed and that reasonable and appropriate conditions are imposed which will prevent the exception request from causing a degradation of water quality. Staff has reviewed the application and exception request and has determined the impacts associated with the proposal to be moderate for the proposed development. Should the board wish to approve this exception request, staff recommends the following conditions be incorporated into its approval. The applicant must obtain all other necessary federal, state, and local permits as required for the project. That a mitigation plan equating to four and a half planting units be submitted prior to the issuance of a building permit. That a surety of $2,250 be submitted to the James City County Stormwater and Resource Protection Division prior to the issuance of a building permit. That this exception request approval shall become null and void if construction has not begun by November 9th, 2023 with written request for an extension be submitted no later than September 28th, 2023. Thank you and I'd be happy to answer any questions the board may have. One of the pictures you referred to one of the corners of the garage is already being on impervious surface. And then it showed gravel. Is that correct? Is that, yeah, am, am I seeing that correctly? Yes, there is some gravel here. Which way does the garage, oh, the garage goes? Uh, yes, this to would the, be to the, the left. Yeah, okay. we were looking at kind of the short side, uh, the 30 foot section of this um, proposed structure. Okay. The long side goes which way? Uh, perpendicular in this, um, towards the woods line. Or the wood line, okay. And uh, based on the contours, this is a fairly flat uh, surface area. That is correct, this is a fairly flat area. Um, I'll allow the applicant to speak towards construction methods. I do believe there was some concern about constructing the garage in other areas due to topographical constraints. Any other questions for Mr. Long? All right. Thank you, Mr. Long. Thank you. Okay, we'll now open the public hearing. Would the applicant like to come forward and speak? Please state your name and address, sir. I will. Uh, Michael Hippel. I live at 821 Arlington Island Road. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I'm here to talk about the um, project in front of you. Um, the Where you're seeing, I'll start with the quad. A few things I want to cover, but we'll start with this right here. There's a second flag you see a little bit back to the end of where the gravel is, and that's a one parking spot that we have where that front one is, that's the gravel road that goes into it. So I've got it up on top of the road as close as I can <clears throat> in order not to get any further down towards a lower end. It's a very flat spot up there. Originally, what I wanted to do was connect it to the house. And if I connected it to the house, I wouldn't have had to come here today. But connecting it to the house where my land right off that side of the house, it dips down towards the water. So this gets it further away from the water from where my house is. Um, I'm in the 50-foot landward side of the RPA. So I'm in the, if you're in there, I'm in the better side of that. Um, you know, the um, that this will be on one foot plus or minus higher than what my slab is on my house right now. 
and to note my elevation on my house right now is 14.2. Flood is 7.1. Freeboard, which is two foot above that, is nine foot one. So I'm way above where any flood would actually occur, even though when it was mapped out years ago, that was considered a flood area. In fact, when I built the um, house and, and went over stuff with staff, you know, they said, well, you're in a floodplain and you know, there was an existing structure, existing house there at time, and three other buildings that I took out of the wetlands area that were actually in the wetlands and pulled those out in a road that went down into the wetlands for hunting and that sort of thing. It was used as a hunt lodge years ago. So I took all that out in order to be able to build the house. And I want to thank staff. They've, they've been excellent to work with and um, everything I've needed. In fact, I call Mike every time I go to cut anything down. And he says, I've been out there three times. Cut the tree down. You're fine. It's rotten. It's dead. <laughs> so we have, a, we have a good connection in there. And be on the, on the board, you want to make sure that, you know, everything is checked and, and taken care of. So by adding on to my house where I originally wanted to put it, there'd be so much fill and it'd be so high on the one corner. Uh, let's move it over here. It's up further away from the water. It's up on a flat spot up there. I can pull off the driveway. Option, the second option is like 390 foot, and the third option is 700 and some, and that's to the center of those structures. So I marked them out. Um, knowing that, you know, with with being so connected with the county and staff and all, you know, I've, we've had these projects come before us and that's sort why, of and you know, you take down X amount of trees, you gotta put down, put in X amount. So I've been diligently putting down and I wanna go over a few of them just so you know. Um, I've got seven eight foot cedar trees I've installed, nine eight foot hollies, seven five foot bayberries, two 20, or, or yeah, two, two 20 foot dogwoods, one five foot dogwood, um, seven three-foot hollies, 25 Russian olives, six two-foot nandinas, 14 one-foot azaleas, seven one-foot peonies, and 44 roses. So understanding that all those aren't native, but a lot of them are native to our area. And that's what I'm trying to plant is the native ones that we don't have to worry about. We don't have to worry about watering and that sort of thing. They're natural in there. They're good cover, good cover for birds and everything else. So, um, Let's see, what else do I have to tell before you? Um, I put it up there to try to mitigate any extra water runoff or anything else. And when I built my house, I got with staff and I had a, I put a berm. They didn't require it. I put a berm down to kind of direct water off you know, the site to make sure it ran slowly through the marsh and into the, the stream. I care a lot about my area over there. In fact, I. Carla, who was here earlier, I talked to her about putting where I've got an old bulkhead. I talked to her about putting a living shoreline in there and what it would take and all that so I could improve that. She said, she told me, Michael, I wouldn't spend the money and putting that on when I, when I um, told staff I was thinking about putting that in there, they were tickled to death because, you know, the living shorelines work. And um, so I wanted to put one of those down there, but Carla looked at it and said, you know, what you've got going on here and how you've addressed this, you don't there's a living shoreline would not add anything to this area, which is separate from the garage area. Um, so like I said, the other locations, 390 and 730 from the um, center of the building to the house. And, you know, 730 feet is a long way when it's raining and putting your truck in the garage and running back to the house. So I think, Eve, you know, I might even get a little wet in that. Um, my plans for the property one day is to do a family subdivision like I did with my um, father and mother for my brothers and sisters years ago. And um, in fact, we were one, if not the first, one of the first in 1990 to start a family subdivision. So this, this would, those other two spots would limit the usability of that land being that it's 64% in wetlands or in RPA, so it would limit my actual high ground. And um, then that lot of mine, as you see, goes, the point goes way down from where my house is. It goes way mm -hmm. down into the marsh. 
so there's a lot of marsh areas so it would take up a lot of land to try to make sure with seven kids to divide it up and and try to you know work something out for any of them that may want to to live there um this will benefit my family and i'm asking that you approve this tonight and um, if there's any questions, I want to thank you for your time that you allowed me to speak tonight on my behalf. And if I have, if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Dude, um, so how did you say you, were, you wanted to handle the increased runoff from the from the garage? What, uh, what we if, and I'm only talking about the one that's in the RPA. The way I've got everything set up on that lot, uh -huh. it will it'll it'll go around the sides of the house and it'll filter all the way down to this point down here naturally. The grade comes all the way down to this point, so it's a, it's a slow grade to get it to go down there. Huh? And I, on, from this even up to where my, the location A is would be the next site, there's a berm that runs down the side of the road that catches it so it doesn't go over the side. It has time to slowly dissipate and then go into the lily pads and marsh before and that's probably from that location there you're probably looking to get to that marsh about seven eight hundred feet so it's a long run to slowly let that water dissipate because when i got there it was going off the sides and there was no control in it it was just you know going off the sides of the um bank so what i did is is designed a little system to try to slow any water that would go over the sides and bring it down through the, the marsh area and slowly go into the creek. So that dissipates any, you know, fast moving water. Could you just go ahead and, uh, could you tell us what you do for a living? I'm a contractor, um, you know, build houses and do some all commercial work and that sort of thing. So this is, you know, nothing for me. I mean, this is what I do all the time. and and not only here in James City County, but across the state and travel quite a bit to different locations. And and um, the nice thing about it with, with doing my work, I can, I can go to another community and go, I know what you expect. And I know what me as a contractor expects. So I know where the middle ground is where most contractors don't understand. Sitting on that side of the fence is a lot different than sitting on this side. You said that if the garage had just been attached to the house, it would have been staff would have been able to approve it. Administrative, but since it's not, and the location it's it's located, it I would have to do more work and build it up higher, and everything else. And uh, where it's where I want to put it, it's it's less work. We got to take some trees down, but it's less work and it's more environmentally friendly up there. On a flat spot then okay so and then one last question for me is just mm -hmm. how many cars in the garage how many cars will be in there yeah for how many cars do we have totally that, yeah, that <laughs> with all the a, kids and all just i've got three driving now uh -huh. it, it will hold four and um but one will probably be for the tractor and the lawnmower and that sort of thing for the maintenance around the property so right. it's mainly for my wife and i and whichever child gets the one spot that we'll have to flip for that one. All right. <laughs> I can't. I can't do that big a girl. <laughs> All right. Thank I'd you, like sir. to. <laughs> other members. The other questions. You said the existing gravel that we were looking at out there is was from an access road of some sort, I believe. It's, it's my main road to come into the house. Okay. And um, if you flip, can you flip back to that one that's going right down the side? Yeah, that go back one right there. That right there is that's my driveway. Okay. That building's going to sit right there in that piece of woods. Okay. So I'll be able to turn off my driveway and drive right into the building. Okay. Thank you. So I tried not to put it any further away from it, just because you know I've already got that impervious cover there, right. and I can just roll right into the garage. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Other questions. How far away was the furthest one from the? The furthest one is 730. And the other one, the next one is 390. And that's to the center of the 60 foot building. I just took a center line because I said, well, you know, if you're on this side, it's a little closer. You're on that side, it's a little further. 
So I just went to the center line of location A and the center line of location B. And location B would be turned like A is. It would be lined up like this because my driveway goes around that side as well. But, you know, 300 and 390 feet is, I'll get a little wet walking back there. <laughs> so that's why I'm asking that, that it, you know, we put it up here. I, I still have from where I originally built the house, 200 square feet. I was over, you know, when I built the house as far as that I didn't use on square footage for the house alone. So, and, and like I told you, staff and I worked together and we had buildings that were in, they were actually in the marsh that I went down there and took out with the excavator, staff approved it, said, hey, look, if you take these out and you take this road out, this road went all the way down into the marsh and there's an old pole still there that was the old utility pole that fed the building down there. Now the building half the time had about this much water in it. I wouldn't want to have been in there with the electricity, but years ago, I guess, it was on high ground probably. But, you know, so the staff said, look, we want to get these out of here. And um, so when I built the house, this July will be five years. When I built that, staff worked with me on that as far as if you take these out and this road out and the size of the house you have, then that we, we, can, we can do something with that. But those have to go in order for us to do anything as far as building. So we had to build where my house is now and then the, all the other buildings, and we took all those out. So we restored that wetlands in there. Like I say, I love the creek. I don't think I'd be anywhere else. I've, I was blessed that, that our family found that and I was able to put my house there. So, you know, it's it's been a – I got ducks and geese are my neighbors, and they're just wonderful. Any other questions? All right, I'll talk to y'all all night, so I'll sit on down. But if you have any other questions, give me a holler and I'll come on back up. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Would anyone else like to come forward to speak on this matter? If not, we'll close the public hearing, open it to the board for discussions. I think um, with this is kind of an unusual situation where it's, where do you put it where it's, convenient to the homeowner. And I think um, where it's proposed there, um, the uh, proposed structure being on the landward side of the RPA, or the yeah, on the landward side, but then as far back as reasonably possible. Because um, I think also that if you were to add it to the house, the fill that would have to be brought in is gonna potentially create a, you know, runoff issue on the uh, seaward side of the RPA. So there's, um, you know, having those other structures back there, location A and location B, like that's really not a very uh, reasonable distance from the house to be kind of practical. Or practical. Um, I really don't think there's really any other area. It seems like that flat area where it's proposed is just about the only area that you could reasonably put a garage in there. I would agree that it looks like the location was chosen in, in a way to minimize the impact. And even though it's in the RP, it's uh, on a pretty solid surface area. It's to be on a high point as well, so you want to have to worry too much about grading around it. So minimizes disturbance. Certainly, in, in looking at it, just he had the option of just attaching it to the house, and then this would have, you know, it, it would have been down in the seaward and, you know, with greater impact, but, um, you know, it would have been easier for him rather than bring it to bring it in front of the board, and then uh, yeah, those alternative locations. I mean, walking walking two football fields from your garage doesn't it is isn't ideal. Um, it, it sounds like he's got the the the, um, the structures within which to kind of corral the the runoff. Um, sounds like he also has the the. Um the surface area for the plantings that are, you know, reasonable. He's got a lot of surface area there to actually, you know, put plantings. Huh. 
there's no other discussions, I'll, I'll make the motion to adopt the resolution to grant the exception request for Chesapeake Bay Board Case Number CBPA 22 Tech 141821 Arlington Island Road. Motion to adopt. Mr. Knight? Yes. Mr. May? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Motion passes 4 0. Okay. The next uh, hearing will be CBPA Tech 22 Tech 0086-9208, Candlelight Court. Ms. Benedict? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Robin Benedict, Watershed Planner, presenting CBPA 22-0086. Mr. Nathaniel Wiley of Blue Ridge Customs, Custom Homes has applied for a Chesapeake Bay exception on behalf of Mr. Steve Garrow for encroachments into the RPA buffer for the construction of a single family dwelling with an attached deck located at 9208 Candlelight Court within the Retreat Subdivision and the Diaskin Creek Watershed. On the vicinity map above, you can see the parcel outlined in blue. Again, that's the Diaskin Creek Watershed outlined in purple. This parcel was platted in 2005 after the changes to the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Ordinance in 2004. At the time, it was under developer review when that ordinance was changed in 2004, and so the lot layout has been grandfathered in. Here's aerial photography um, showing the existing lot. The topography at the site, um, at the proposed project location, it's fairly flat and gets um, steeper towards the back of the property. Here's the resource protection area on the property shown in orange. The total lot size of this property is 3.39 acres, of which 84% is located within the RPA. Here's the proposed site plan. The applicant is proposing to construct a new single family dwelling with an attached deck. Again, the existing conditions on this lot um, include a completely wooded lot with wetlands that span across the middle of the parcel. Here you can see the 100 foot and 50 foot resource protection area in red, as well as the edge of wetlands shown in green, again, going across the middle of this property. In yellow is the proposed single family dwelling and area of the driveway that's within the land landward 50 foot RPA. And in orange is the proposed single family dwelling and driveway within the seaward 50 foot RPA. Total impacts to the RPA associated with this proposal equate to 1,720 square feet of impacts to the landward 50 foot RPA and 2,365 square feet of impacts to the seaward 50 foot RPA for a total of 4,085 square feet of impacts. Required mitigation for this amount of impacts equals 10 planting units, which is 10 canopy trees, 20 understory trees, and 30 shrubs. Um, also on this site plan, the limits of clearing, which is the thicker black line um, around the home, and the platted drain fields to the left of the proposed house, uh, the primary drain field and then reserve drain fields. Additionally, staff reviewed an alternative site location um, with the house across the ravine. This would place the house entirely outside of the RPA, um, and that would constitute it as an administrative approval from Stormwater and Resource Protection Division. Um, the approval would be for the actual driveway crossing um, and impacts to the RPA. This location, although entirely outside of the RPA, would place the single family, or it would constitute impacts that would equate to approximately 9,500 square feet or double what is being proposed here tonight. It would also require a unit. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers permit for the wetlands and stream crossing. Staff feels that the preferred, preferred alternative is justifiable due to the lesser amount of impacts to the RPA and wetlands. Um, again, on this alternative site plan, the 100-foot resource protection area and 50-foot resource protection area, as well as that edge of wetlands and the alternative location 
first sight photography, standing um, in the road before the parcel and looking at the front of the lot. Stepping into the lot just a little bit, looking um, at the edge of wetlands. Further down into the wetlands, uh, beyond where the house will be settled. Looking to the other side, um, down along the wetlands, you can see some of the flagging here in the site photograph. And looking back up um, towards the actual house placement. And up, or I'm sorry, this is looking further back, um, showing the slope upwards as you go further into the property. Just a few more photos of the actual wetlands that exist. And this is um, flagged out for those reserve um, and primary drain fields. Staff has evaluated the application and exception request for the construction of a single family dwelling with an attached deck. This application meets the ordinance conditions in sections 23-11 and 23-14 and should be heard by the board because the construction of a single family dwelling extends into the seaward 50 foot RPA. The board may grant exceptions to section 23-7 if the application meets the following five conditions. The exception request is the minimum necessary to afford relief. Granting the exception will not confer upon the applicant any special privileges to other property owners uh, in the vicinity. The exception request will be in harmony with the purpose and intent of Chapter 23 and is not a substantial detriment to water quality. The exception request is not based on conditions or circumstances that are self-created or self-imposed and reasonable conditions are imposed which will prevent the exception request from causing a degradation of water quality. Staff has reviewed the application and exception request and has determined the impacts associated with the proposal to be major for the proposed development. Staff recommends approval for this exception request and if the board wishes to approve the request, staff recommends the following conditions be incorporated into the approval. The applicant must obtain all of the necessary federal, state, and local permits as required for the project. The application, I'm sorry, the applicant must submit a mitigation plan equating to 10 planting units to the Stormwater and Resource Protection Division prior to project start. A surety of $5,000 must be submitted to guarantee the mitigation plantings. Then an affidavit must be recorded in the Williamsburg James City County Courthouse prior to the issuance of a building permit that a six foot chain link fence must be installed at the limits of clearing to reduce impacts to the adjacent wetlands. This exception request approval shall become null and void if construction is not begun by November 9th, 2023 with written request for an extension submitted to the Stormwater and Resource Protection Division no later than September 28th, 2023, which is six weeks prior to the expiration date. Thank you. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them at this time. Um, was there an individual breakdown for the uh, between the house and the driveway for the square footage of impervious surface? Um, no, I do not have those numbers tonight. Okay. And then was there so that it looked like the one corner of the house went all the way down just about to the wetlands? Correct. Did you guys have a picture of that? Far right corner of the house. Yeah, not exactly in that um, position. That might be the closest that we could get, although it's turned a little further. Um, okay. 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 Thank you. I'm not familiar with this location, but the wetlands are um, under extreme conditions can get water from what water source? Where, where is this near? Or is this just um, like watershed um, area where the, the water is coming from run uh, runoff? Mr. O'Brien, those are seep driven wetlands, uh, wetland systems and um, 
the agent can further clarify that if um, if necessary. Because everything appears to be fairly dry here in these pictures. Okay. Um, how does this proposed structure compare to the neighboring or adjacent lots in terms of the impervious cover or locations relative to the RPA? Are they pretty consistent with where they're located on the lot and of similar build? If, I'm not sure if that's something you would know because I'm a little unfamiliar with the area as well. Sure. Um, I'm actually also a little unfamiliar with the surrounding lots. So, if Mr. Wilson, if you could give some background. <laughs> Mr. Knight, the... Um, the size of the house is comparable to others in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, RPA impacts are are dependent upon the site specific conditions on each on each property, um, and I would say it's nothing unusual um, for this neighborhood. Okay, cool. Thank you. I, and I know you explained it earlier in the presentation, but if you could just summarize for me again the the uh, information around it would be twice the wetlands impact if they took the driveway through the wetlands up to that area outside of the RPA? Yes. So um, as it's currently proposed, it's about 4,085 square feet of impacts. If they were to move the house using the alternative site plan, um, while the house would be entirely outside of the RPA, crossing through all of the RPA with the driveway and through the wetlands would just about double the amount of impacts, um, approximately to 9,500 square feet. Mr. O'Brien, I can further clarify that. The knoll where the alternative house location is shown is approximately 20 feet above the wetland system. So in order to cross that wetland system, you need about 10 plus or minus feet of fill. Um, so it equated to about 50 foot of wetland impact uh, across the entire uh, 50 foot RPA and then it narrowed down as you go up um, we approximated about 9,500 square feet, as uh, Ms. Benedict to said. It um, put like a berm there to, to run the gravel driveway on, and then with a, a culvert underneath it? Yes, sir. Okay. So there, there's, uh, there's, was there any discussion as far as pulling the, the house even further forward? I'm, I'm assuming was there some type of, because it's still right up against the, the vegetated wetlands, so why? Um, I, I see that the fields are to the left. Um, yes, so um, it may be a little difficult to see. I apologize for not highlighting it, but this arc right in front of the house is actually the uh, front setback. So uh, they have okay. pulled the house as far mm -hmm. forward as they possibly can. It, it, um, this might be for the applicant, but there's, was there any discussion about flipping the fields in the house, or is there some type of requirement for the fields, why they can't, why they're, I presume there's a requirement that they're there for a reason, because they're, they're predi predominantly in the landward, which we always try and pull it. Yes, they are where the uh, soils are conducive for septic. Uh, there had been some studies done and uh, approved by the health department. And to flip them, all those studies would have to be redone and it and potentially uh, may not work because they are lower in uh, topography toward closer towards the wetlands. Thank you. <clears throat> and, and you probably know this better than I do, but uh, for septic fields, aren't, aren't they supposed to be on, uh, you know, the, the contour lines have to be a, a, such that there's not a steep bank. Uh, yeah, the, the fields themselves haven't been designed and laid out, but that is correct. They need to be on contour. Yeah, which uh, would, we should explain why they would put them off to the left. Yeah. Is, there a, um, is there a minimum square footage requirement to build in that neighborhood? And if, if so, where does this house fall on, on that spectrum? I'm not sure if I'm 
for that. I don't know that number um, off the top of my head is something that I could get back to you on, or perhaps um, the contractor may be able to answer for you. If there's no other questions, thank you, Ms. Benedict. All right. So we'll go ahead and open up the public hearing. Would the applicant like to come forward and speak? Good evening. I'm Emily Salkin of Balzer and Associates. That's 15871 City View Drive in Suite 200, Midlothian, Virginia 23113. I am here speaking on behalf of the property owner and of the builder of Blue Ridge Custom Homes. I work as an environmental project manager at Balzer and Associates. I am a licensed soil scientist and a wetland delineator and had the pleasure of meeting the staff on the property to discuss this project. Um, I do appreciate the presentation that Robin put together and the time that the chair and the board have taken in hearing our case tonight. Um, to answer some of the questions that were asked earlier of Robin, I do want to clarify the minimum size for the house in this neighborhood is 2,100 square feet and the footprint that's offered is 2,600. That is inclusive of the covered porch, which may not constitute living area per that standard under the HOA. Um, the soil studies have been done and approved by VDH. Those drain fields are platted, so in order to have them moved, we would have to seek a new permit from VDH. Other soil locations were not found to park on the site, so using those um, convex slopes in the location provided are really the only option. And so in addition to you know our alternative of moving the house to the back of the property and having to provide extra fill and grading, culvert sizing, a changing plan going through obviously this group here and um, VDH, we would need to provide a pump in order to get all of the waste to the front of the lot. Um, this is obviously excess cost to the building over, especially when it, it results in double of the RPA impact, as well as impacts to wetlands, which are avoided with this plan. I'd be happy to answer any other questions as they may have come to mind. How would you handle the, so the runoff coming off the house now, where, where, do you have a, a plan for how you're gonna treat that water before it gets right into the wetlands? In discussions with staff um, on site, we thought about doing um, roof drain captures for the lot as well as doing strategic planting in order to make sure that there is sufficient vegetation along the wetlands there incorporated into our planting plan for mitigation. I think you were going to co comment on the, the uh, wetlands. Yes, yes. So they are, um, as Mr. Wilson said, they are seep driven wetlands um, carrying drainage from two seeps just off the site to the east toward that western juncture with a perennial channel. So the RPA here is driven from connectivity of wetlands and not via the intermittent stream channel that forms on the site. Any other questions? Thank you, ma'am. Absolutely, thank you. Would anyone else like to come forward and speak on this matter? Uh, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing and open it to the board for discussions. Hold the sack was on the other side of the property. It would be uh, pretty straightforward. It wouldn't even be talking to us. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's they're trying. It looks like they're trying to make the best out of probably you know out of a out of a difficult problem. Um, this is smaller than some of the houses we see in other housing developments. They get dropped in. Um, you know, it being right up against the the wetlands is not ideal, but it's better than the impacts that would occur to the wetlands from the alternate site. I agree. I think this this proposal here essentially is kind of making the best of a not so great situation. 
Yeah. As Mr. Wilson pointed out, it's comparable to the adjacent properties in the neighborhood at large, so. Okay, would anyone like to make a motion? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to adopt the resolution to grant the exception request for Chesapeake Bay Board case number CBPA 2200869208, Candlelight Court. So we have a motion to adopt. Mr. Knight? Yes. Mr. May? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Motion passes 4-0. Okay, so the next case will be CBPA TAC 22 TAC 0135 at 134 Swinley Forest. Mr. Long. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Trevor Long, watershed planner. Um, Mr. Matthew Roth of Roth Environmental LLC has requested a deferral of this application um, for exception to the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Ordinance. Um, in order to further revise the site plan and um, uh, based on <coughs> discussion amongst the, uh, staff and the applicant. Um, as this case has been public noticed, staff recommends that the public hearing be opened and stay opened until the December meeting, um, at which time the case will be heard. Okay. Do we need to, uh, do we need to vote for a deferral? Uh, yes, please, uh, Mr. Chair. Please open the public hearing, and then um, uh, somebody will need to make a motion to approve the deferral request from the applicant. Okay, so open the public hearing. And, and, and please uh, allow anybody who's here who wishes to speak to speak, please. Absolutely. If anyone would like to come forward and speak on this matter, please come forward, state your name and address. Okay. Keep the public hearing open. So we'll leave the public hearing open. Make a motion to approve the deferral from the applicant for CBPA 22-0135, 134 Swinley Forest. So we have a motion to approve the deferral request. Mr. Knight? Yes. Mr. May? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. So the next uh, hearing is CBPA Tech 22 Tech 0139 at 2800 Durfee's Mill Road. Ms. Benedict. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Robin Benedict, Watership Planner. Mr. Ryan Stevenson with AES Consulting Engineers has requested a deferral of this application for exception to the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Ordinance while the site plan is finalized for the project. Staff concurs with this request. As this case has been public notice, staff recommends that the public hearing be open and stay open until the December meeting, at which time the case will be heard. Very well, so we'll open up the public hearing. Would anyone like to come forward and speak on this matter? Please state your name and address. Okay. And referral. Mr. Chairman, I would like to make a motion to um, approve the deferral request for the applicant for CBPA 22-0139, 2800 Durfee's Mill Road. Okay, we have a motion uh, to approve the deferral request from the applicant. Mr. Knight? Um, I'd like to recuse my vote due to conflict of interest. So noted. Mr. May? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Motion passes 3-0. Very well, uh, board considerations. The calendar has already been uh, addressed in the wetlands. Do we need to do anything else for that? Yes. Yeah, let, let's uh, formally adopt the calendar for Chesapeake Bay as well, please. Uh, just a voice, a voice vote to accept the calendar for the 2023 meetings. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Voice vote passes. Um, and election of officers is deferred. Very well. And so that concludes board considerations. There are no matters of special privilege. Uh, can I have a motion to adjourn?
Motion to adjourn. Moved.